Coming up on this episode of Outlook TV, Jeffrey Straker's video, Ready to be Brave. Queer Prov update and back in person live. Montreal Pride's Afro Drag. And much, much more. Hello and welcome to Outlook TV. I'm Rebecca Wyman. And I'm T. We'd like to thank the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations for the privilege of filming this episode of Outlook TV on their traditional unceded lands. Outlook TV is the queer news magazine show that brings you the stories that matter the most from coast to coast. And we're going to kick it off with the Queer Cinema Archives. Yes, queer people have been around for ages, but the signs have been hidden in cinema. We're going to find out what those are. Hey, viewers. We're here with Derek LeBeau, and he's a cinephile, a major cinephile. He knows everything about queer representation in film from the beginning and right up to today. Let's go talk to him and learn something. When I was nine, I had a crush on this older guy. Queer Cinema Archive is kind of a, a look at of representation um, dating back to the beginning of film history. So I'd started by having an interest in classic film and then I'd done a lot of research through, um, through papers and things I'd written in university and it kind of led me down the rabbit hole of pretty much the beginning of representation in, in film which was a lot of these are or pansy characters on screen. They're usually effeminate male characters or um, you would get usually butch women to represent lesbians. It starts out in the early 1900s. You've, you've got these stereotypical gay characters that are played for laughs, which is not exactly great representation, but it's still representation. And then it transforms into uh, characters who, like these stereotypical characters who have voices in the, the early 1930s. They get completely cut out in, 19, in 1934 when the Hays Code implemented all these crazy rules like queerness was kind of dubbed sexual perversion until that form of censorship ended in the late 1960s. Queer coding doesn't necessarily mean the character themselves is gay or bisexual, but, um, but that there is an aspect to the relationship that could be queer. We do still see it in, in films today. Basically, pretty much any classic Disney cartoon that has a villain, uh, because Disney is infamous for their queer coding. A lot of their, their Disney villains have been um, made effeminate to reflect a sort of gay style or a queer style. So I created the, the Instagram account Queer Cinema Archive December of uh, 2020. I've been writing like basically mini essays about um, a movie a day since, well, for over a year now, and the account just recently hit uh, 10,000 followers. So I'm meeting people who have similar interests and we're sharing, sharing information. Sometimes they're, they're coming onto my account and sharing their own research. Other instances too, where I've had um, some up and coming filmmakers who are following my account request to have their um, films or maybe web series shown. And that's another thing I'm able to do is I'm able to amplify other queer voices. It, it just feels really rewarding to be able to do that. And I'm, I'm hoping as, as the page continues to grow, I'm gonna be able to continue to do that for um, queer filmmakers and queer artists, as well as share my own research and information about queer representation throughout history. If people are interested in, in learning more about queer representation on film, you can find me at Queer Cinema Archive uh, on Instagram. And feel free to, to message me if they have films that they'd like to see represented on there, or if there's anything that they want to um, talk about film-wise with me. I'm, I'm always open to, um, to, to film talk. This has been John Cross from Without Look TV. Well, that was certainly educational. Don't forget to check out Derek's Instagram account. See you next time. Now let's go check out Vancouver's Sum Gallery for the new show, Sovereignty. Yes, we're catching up with Two-Spirit photographer Dwayne Isaacs. Mask maker and photographer Dwayne Isaac is having their first ever show here at the Sum Gallery called Sovereignty. I'm talking to the artist tonight and the curator about this amazing event. I originally saw Dwayne Isaac in, um, in Canadian art and I was just like, wow, this this." This guy, this person is amazing. But we had a chat with them, and they said they hadn't had a solo show. This is that work. Dwayne is a um, photographer and a, a mask maker. I wants to make sure that everybody knows that the, the masks are really a feria. They're not made to last. They're they're made to um, 
for, her, for, for them to photograph on the models. When I first started making masks, I would, um, I would just buy sort of Halloween masks from the Dollarama and sort of uh, bedazzle them and uh, repaint them and sort of cut parts out and stick new things on. You know, I thought like, okay, I'm going to need to start making my own sort of uh, stuff from scratch. But um, where the ideas come from, uh, I'm usually sort of inspired by uh, like horror creatures, but also I want to like marry them with like um, beautiful imagery, sort of like uh, very sort of uh, detailed uh, Baroque imagery with uh, these sort of uh, ornate, ornate sort of patterns and styles. I also like um, insects, glitter, you know, and uh, anime characters. I sort of, sort of delve all of that and it all kind of just goes in there and comes out uh, as you see in my work. I want people to come with their, with their own ideas from it. Basically what I'm doing is creating uh, an image that forces people to sort of have this disconnection from the, the person wearing it. There are no eyes, you know, there's nothing to sort of, sort of uh, connect with on a human level. And I think it sort of uneases people it intrigues some people, it turns on some people, you know, people are very into this sort of mysterious or creepy or uh, interesting sort of feelings that they get out of my work. And I, I, I really enjoy that. In terms of the themes of the show of sovereignty and what it means about the land and the body connection, uh, we're sort of talking about the health of the environment being connected to the health of the body. A healthy body, healthy land, et cetera, vice versa. When we talk about this, especially from like an indigenous lens, you think of like the boilers that are in so many First Nation communities. You think of these sort of themes of uh, violence attributed to people trying to protect the land. And all these sort of things that are happening inspired my sort of viewpoint. The work is so multi-layered. That's what I love about uh, Dwayne's work. I find it really multi-layered, right? It's about objectification, but it's about sovereignty. It's very queer without there being a, an overt queerness to it, but it's very, I find it very queer work. Sovereignty runs until May 14th here at the Sum Gallery. For Outlook TV, this is Ollie in Vancouver. We're going to take a little break now. Good timing. I'm going to go find my Valentine. I think I lost him. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeffrey Straker. I'm a singer, songwriter, pianist here in Saskatchewan, and you are watching Outlook TV. Ready to be brave. Welcome back. You're watching Outlook TV. You know what? It takes a lot of bravery and courage to come out. Do you know what else is brave? Riding a cowboy and saving a horse. Hello Canada, my name is Bruno and today I'm speaking with singer, songwriter and pianist Jeffrey Straker about his moving song and award-winning video, Ready to be Brave. Oh, is a white flag I, I think video for Ready to be Brave um, was co-created with a with a director from here in Saskatchewan and um, and then produced and directed by, by himself. And it's a take on my song, Ready to be Brave, that isn't in particular about any specific moment. But we chose to make the video rendition of the song to be about a, a coming out story. And um, we decided to set it on a farm in rural Saskatchewan. Though this is not autobiographical in any way but particularly I have a lot of friends who grew up on farms who you know who ended up sort of realizing they were gay after they left the farm and this is almost kind of a their story so it's it's an amalgamation of a bunch of stories and and this coming out story set on a farm is kind of a fairly sort of masculine traditional kind of place and in doing so to me it it almost sort of like puts a magnifying glass on coming out in a way and puts a megaphone on it. Not necessarily a coming out song, it's a song about mustering up courage to do something. And certainly in the back of my mind as I was writing it, there was certainly some of my 
my experience of mustering up the courage to come out to my parents way back when. I mean, this is a long time ago now for me, but I can still see it, you know, as plain as day. Oh, 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 a white flag I raise. The hat does, does, does appear, I mean, um, almost from, from, from the start of the video. And there's this very uh, special moment where the dad hands his hat to the son and there's a sort of like passing of a torch, if you will. I think it's the nature of parents. Parents want to give, they want to ensure that part of them is in their kids and, you know, symbolically, etc. And then, then, then there's the boy left with this hat and he keeps this hat. Even when he returns to the farm to finally have this moment of where he's ready to be brave with his father, he's, he's got the hat, he's holding the hat, he's nervous. So the hat is like this piece of his father that he that he's carries with him. And, and I think it was a clever metaphor. Yeah. The authenticity can draw people in. To me, this video is such a real story and it's got grit and it's got a loving mother who tries to help the son through the, the agony of his rejecting father. It's got all this real stuff that whether you're queer or not, I think you can realize, I think that's what helped it get the reception that it did. Ready to be brave. Through 2022, I'm gonna release more singles and, I, and I'm really excited about some of the stuff that's coming out of me in these songs. I mean, songwriting is a beautiful process. You, you sort of start knowing what you're gonna talk about and at a certain point, the song then tells you what it wants to be about. Mind if we talk? Stay tuned for more new music from Jeffrey Straker. For Outlook TV, I'm Bruno coming to you from Toronto. Let's head out to the junction in Vancouver for Queer Prov. They're back live, mon dieu. Hey you guys, I am personally excited about this one. Queer Prov is back at the junction uh, with some of Vancouver's top comedy actors in the improv scene today. And what better way to break the ice than with their legendary show, The Fruit Bowl. So come on gays, we're going to the market. A quarter? A quarter? <laughs> I can't do this. We're having our first Fruit Bowl at the junction over two years. So uh, we're really excited. We're doing one of our favorite formats as Queer Prov in, in our favorite venue for the first time in a long time. And we've got, so far, a, a big audience and a lot of energy. Game of Fruit Bowl is a head-to-head, -head, team v. team, highly competitive improv form uh, where we have these two teams and they each do a game and then the audience votes on which team they think did better. We see who is going to win the coveted Fruit Bowl at the end of the night. One, two, three! Oh! What it means for me to be back on stage is that we're actually sensing each other's presence in real life I, after we've been behind screens for so long. I to do some online stuff, but it just, it's not the same. You don't have the same connection and there's not that ritual of going to the place, so it's so exciting to be back. Improv is kind of a comedy where you really rely on your teammates. So if you freeze up, you can kind of relax knowing that um, your teammates will be there su to support you. Now for me, uh, as an oldest child, I'm used to just talking uh, nonstop and getting my way in and out of trouble. So I don't tend to have a lot of blocks. But uh, if I do, I know uh, my troop would be there for me 100%. And uh, cognitive function are pretty important skills to have when you're a surgeon. <laughs> Comedy is vital to our community because it's a space where we can invite joy back into our lives. Sex with me is like a screwdriver. You think you're not going to need it, but you do. Um, and we also have an education line. So we have workshops that we hold. Um, they're at Tightrope Theatre and they're also here at Community um, on Davy Street. Um, and it's just very important to get people out to shake off jitters or learn how to public speak or know how to be comfortable when you're with strangers or honestly do some advanced improv if that's what you're in for. We have all levels. Sex with me is like a screwdriver. I'll pin you up against a wall. Each week, we are Queer Prov 
And also, each week we have a different format. So every week, if you come to Queer Prop, you're going to see a, a different show. And we're trying to do all sorts of new formats as well as our favorites like Fruit Bowl. Once a month, for the rest of the winter into the spring, we're going to be doing a monthly at Tightrope Theatre on Main Street as well. Well, what can I say? The proof is in the pudding as long as the fruit's in the bowl. I'm Emily Ann Fraser. You're watching Outlook TV Vancouver. We're going to have to take another little break now. Perfect, because I did not find my Valentine's. Thus, I'm still single. Hey darlings, it's me, Robert Adam, and I am a country singer-songwriter from Alberta, Canada, and you're watching Outlook TV. Welcome back, you're watching Outlook TV. Robert Adam is next, and he's like a rhinestone cowboy. Oh, wait, I'm not allowed to touch it. From Bonnyville to the Bright Lights, a Project Wild finalist. His brand new single, Don't Touch My Rhinestones, says it all. He's opening more doors than he knows. Country singer Robert Adam is on Outlook TV. I am the Dream Angel Cowboy of Calgary or Crossfield. Um, I basically um, came from Bonneville, Alberta, grew up pretty rural in the northern part of Alberta there, and surrounded by a bunch of blue collar working people, always had um, CMT music video countdowns in the background. With... At first when I was younger, I wasn't really interested in country things or country music, but later in my adulthood, as I really started to fully form who I am as a person, I really identified and related to my roots and came back to them to become a fully realized person. And um, at around 25, I started to write and sing country music and really am in love with the 70s country aesthetic and sound as well. So that's very much what I do. I find a lot of uh, the older boomer generation, I can find them in my audience, despite me being quite progressive looking, um, because I do remind them of their country music when they were young, their Loretta Lynn records and their Patsy Cline records and their Johnny Cash records. And um, I also just want people to, whether they're from the country um, or not, to feel like they've known the places and They've known the experiences that I've had, even though they may not have had them by storytelling. And that's another huge part of that older 70s music. 70s country's music is the ability to use lyrics and textures to tell really clear and um, poignant stories and imageries that people feel like they're there themselves. Are you feeling lucky? Are you feeling lucky? Feeling Lucky was actually a video I used to audition for Project Wild, where 12 of us were chosen to compete for $100,000. Quite a big one. And we are nearing the end of that competition. We'll find out who wins the top three prizes at the end of March. So I'm really fighting hard to win it for the queers. Don't touch my rhinestones. Don't touch my rhinestones. It is very queer. It's about not letting people take away your shine because you're doing good, because you're healthy. It's, I just hope people can listen to that song especially and uh, have it as their war path song for getting stuff done, doing their goals and not letting anyone tell them any different. Don't touch my rhinestone. Wow, what a guy. We just caught up with country singer Robert Adam. This is Patrick Massey for Outlook TV in Whistler, BC. February is Black History Month, so we're going to go back in our archives and pluck out this piece of history. We're heading back to Montreal 2019, you know, when we could all gather. For Afro Pride. Big Sissy thought there was not enough representation of black drag queens on the Montreal scene, so she created an event called Afro Drag. And Afro Drag is presenting a first show here tonight at Montreal Pride. Black Star Afro Drag basically just 
developed because I've been doing drag for several years in Montreal and I was always the only black performer on the bill. So it made me wonder why are, isn't my community in these spaces? Do they not feel comfortable? Like, where are they? And I wanted to create a safe space for people to start exploring drag within the black community. So we've got like a burlesque inspired drag, we've got king drag, we've got live music drag, which is what I do. Uh, in the past, we've had like spoken word. It's very creative. Um, we've got androgynous performers. It's very open to interpretation. Big Sissy developed really out of the songs that I was writing that I didn't have an outlet for with my um, solo project, Ms. Holmes. And so the songs were all had little stories to them and I ended up developing this character so that she could tell the stories of these songs. And um, Big Sissy is a witch from Black Star Planet and she's stuck on Earth, which she's not very happy about, but she, she, she entertains herself with sex and food mostly while she's here. Our burlesque performer is Chameleon, who is actually based in Toronto. We've got Noka Palm Trees, who's a local Montreal performer who did their debut through Afro Drag in February. And we've got uh, Trey Thongs, who's our king performer, and Kiara, who is a, an amazing, very fishy queen who's really popular in the village. She does a lot of shows, and this is the first time I get to work with her. I feel like it's important for us to really celebrate our culture and to uh, reunite because we kind of have the same experiences. We uh, uh, not only are we queer, but we're people of color. So you know, challenges are coming to us every day, and uh, it's nice to to feel like we belong to a community and to feel strong in that community and to feel like we're empowered. <laughs> From Espace Casino de Montréal, this is Ali for Outlook TV. That's all the time we have for this episode of Outlook TV, but we'll be back, well, before the sequins fall off tea shoes. In the meantime, why don't you follow us on all our social media platforms? And better yet, why don't you consider volunteering with us? We're always looking for more volunteers to wear these pretty shoes. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm Rebecca Wyman. And I'm T. Stay, Stay safe, safe, Canada. Canada.